is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering nothing at all, and yet everything. This is a freestyle episode uh, sponsored by Yama Castillo, in which she asks me to talk about the books that I have read, what I recommend, what I recommend that you avoid, and some of my own personal favorites. I'm actually pretty excited about this. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. So this episode, I'm going to be going over all of the books that I have read one by one. I'm just kidding. I'm not really doing that. What I have a little bit of trouble with here is it's, you know, normally when you're talking about like books that I'd recommend, we'd go by genres, but almost all of the books that I have read have been, and I'm talking about for the podcast specifically, but also personally, have been fiction. There's been very little nonfiction and the vast majority of them have been fantasy. Some of them have not. There have been, you know, just some straightforward fiction that I am, for example, uh, listening to right now as an audio book. I'm listening to the Kinsey Milhone series, which is many of you would know is uh, the alphabet murders. A is for alibi, B is for burglary, all of those. Um, So it's hard for me to know exactly how to break these down. And also there are things that I have read such a long time ago now. Um, And by such a long time ago, I really don't mean that far back. Like the the book club for Unspoiled started in 2016 in May. So almost exactly three years ago. Um, It hasn't been that far back, but it's been enough time that I feel like I have already had some taste changes and some different standards now than I used to have. So this is going to be, um, these are going to be some qualifications that may run slightly counter to what my review had been when I actually did the episode on it. So I don't want to catch anybody by surprise who's like, listen to how I talk about one book. And I said that I loved it. And then once I talk about it here, they're like, but you said you loved it. What the hell? Maybe I changed. You know, and that's fine. We should, to be honest. Um, So to start off with, my standards for books that I love are usually character driven. And we all, if you listen to Unspoiled, you know this about me. Plot is for me very secondary. In fact, plot often can matter far less than character stuff which is part of why so many of us have gotten so invested in like the post credits sequences on like Marvel movies. The post credit sequences are rarely like bringing up new plot points or doing anything to open doors in that regard. The post credit sequences are usually a moment that we get to spend with a character that we have grown to know and love that feel significant to us because we know them so well that this moment is particularly funny or particularly moving because of that. And that is the sort of shit that I live for. And that's a really tough thing to do with a single book. So there are going to be times where I'm unfairly giving a lot more credit to series in which they've understandably had a lot of time to establish things in which a single book is going to have trouble doing. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. So the very first book that I covered for the book club is one that I recommend wholeheartedly. And I apologize to everybody for how long the episode was. The first book that I covered for the book club was World War Z. And I had to divide it into two episodes. Each episode was two hours long. Because I had never done a book club episode. And I was not prepared for how much I was going to have to skip when I talked about it because of time constraints. Those of you who have not read World War Z, if you are at all interested in logistics the same way that I am, and if you are at all into the idea of zombie apocalypse, which I have to say, I'm not that interested. 
World War Z is just you can't miss it. You have to you have to read it. And the audiobook is super, super well done. It's a full cast. And it's so compelling and full of all of the weird minutia that I'm just obsessed with, you know. Um, so yeah, highly recommended. Um, I am going to come right out of the gate and say, I find that most of the books that I have covered by Neil Gaiman have been, in my opinion, overrated. Not a huge fan. Um, this is the kind of thing that I understand why people like him as much as they do, but I find Neil Gaiman to rely almost to the point of it being a crutch on other mythologies and care like established mythological characters in a way that feels a lot more like fan fiction sometimes than his own stories. Um, so those, I would say if you're somebody who really enjoys like references and allegories and that kind of thing, then that probably would work for you. But for me, that that I find boring a lot of the time. So I pull back on that. Um, and there's also something to be said for like, you know, stories that do that, that where it's a surprise because it's completely unexpected. I'm able to deal with the inclusion of those kinds of mythological characters when I don't see it coming and it feels like a little bit of a twist. But with Neil Gaiman, I am, I go into his books assuming that that's going to be there. And when it is, it just feels like, yeah, 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 kind of, you know, get a move on hand movement. Um, so I want to I want to talk about World War. Well, I wanted to talk about World War Z right off the top, because that was the book that started off the book club. And it was like, as much as it is a fiction, and I think one could argue a fantasy as well. Um, it It was the first book that introduced me to a type of writing that I don't feel like I had been like, prepared for or that I had been exposed to very much. I am very into um, British children's literature. I always have been. And the fantasy books that I have been attracted to as an adult have been reminiscent of that style. And World War Z is so very modern um, that it was a, a huge change for me in reading. So that kind of kicks off so much of the changes that I kind of had to mentally prep myself for in the book club, because the book club, there are, there's a lot of books here that people voted for that I get the feeling they voted for them simply because they were interested to see what I would say and not because they really loved the book. An example of this is Ready Player One. Ready Player One is the kind of book that I'm pretty sure everybody went like voted for expecting me to completely trash it. And I enjoyed the hell out of that book. It's one of those that like all of the shit people say about it is absolutely 100% accurate. But if you are somebody who enjoys pop culture references, a pretty predictable storyline, but one that has, you know, the heroes overcoming an evil corporation. It's super, it's super predictable in a lot of ways and follows a lot of tropes, whatever. But it owns that and it feels like it works because of how involved with tropes the story itself is in terms of like meta references to those tropes. So for me... I totally understand people's frustration with Ready Player One and irritation with the main character who is like a total gatekeeper. Just in general, he he is a really good example of everything that we hate about like uh, modern online gamer dudes who want to gatekeep comic books or whatever. It's completely understandable why people hate it the way that they do for whatever reason. It did not bother me the way I feel like it could have if it were written at all differently. So take that for what you will. 
Um, so that book was one that I feel like people just wanted to hear me talk about, but they weren't necessarily themselves huge fans of it. Um, Rachel says, I didn't realize people hated it. I actually really liked it. See, I, <laughs> if you listen to the, um, the overdue episode, they pretty much trash the book and they are completely right about everything they say. They're like, I will own that. They're, they don't make a single criticism that I feel is out of line, but none of it bothered me that much. So it's the sort of thing that, you know, I feel like it's pretty rare for me to run into that something where I feel like everything, all the, all the shit people say, I am kind of like, yeah, no, that's true. But I still like it. Usually when people do that and I agree with them, I start to change my perspective on it. And I'm like, actually, OK, maybe this is trash. But uh, that did not happen with Ready Player One. Um, as far as books that people have commissioned for Spoil Me, I've been really lucky in that everybody has had excellent taste. There are obviously some books that I'm in the middle of right now, so I'm not sure how they'll resolve. And I don't want to recommend anything that I haven't finished because I feel like that's just setting things up to be disappointing later. And somebody is going to email me and yell at me that, what about this at the end? And I'm going to be like, I didn't know. I'm sorry. Um, but, oh, Rachel is bringing up Sunshine. Sunshine those, if you're into vampire stories, Sunshine is a really unique take on a vampire story. And it's, I thought, excellently written. Um, it deals a lot with PTSD. So if you are sensitive to that sort of subject matter, be careful with it. But it's not explicitly, it's not like, it's akin to the sort of PTSD one would experience with a sexual assault, but she is not sexually assaulted in the book. It's, it's sort of a, an allegory for that or a metaphor. Um, and it's super duper weird, but weird in a way that I really enjoyed. And that felt very fresh and original to me. Recommend sunshine. Definitely. Um, another book that I just wrapped on and that I keep recommending to everyone who will listen is the grace of kings kyle you're in here kyle is over here the one who commissioned that entire book so thank you kyle grace of kings y'all if you want a story that is going to make you fist pump and maybe cry and have like an uh, that reaction of like are they serious right now and also has a ton of really amazing female characters and yet is written by a dude who didn't fuck up female characters shocker I can't recommend Grace of Kings enough. It is really fun, a really like wild over the top sort of world and yet grounded enough to not feel like you're in it, it, it's grounded enough to not feel like literally anything can happen. So I have no idea. It's just I'm I kept being impressed with the characterization of women characters, especially but everybody in those books is written well. And the way the story progresses is completely character driven. And that is incredibly important to me. Despite it being character driven, the stakes are enormous. And everything that happens is on, it sort of feels mythical in a way. Um, so I am super, super behind Grace of Kings. There's another book in the series. Um, so I don't know about the second book. I have not read that, but I just finished the first one and I just loved it. Um, Rachel says, I was waiting for you to finish it before I started so I wouldn't have to wait to listen to the podcast. Yeah, do, start it. Do it. Um, if you like that, there are lots of others in that way you would like. Can't wait for you to get there. Oh, sweet. Um, so yeah, that's one that I in particular have just... I have noticed every time it's time to cover that, I'm like, oh, sweet. I can't wait to find out what happens. Um, and it's funny because a lot of the, the books I've covered, I will feel that way about. But you can tell the different levels of that, you know. Um, so another book, and I, I'm going to couch a lot of these that I'm recommending with kind of, I don't even want to say trigger warnings just warnings in general. Um, I covered in the very beginnings of Spoil Me, um, Fire and Hemlock by Diana Wynne-Jones, which was uh, commissioned by Patricia Bing Grant. 
And Fire and Hemlock is a sort of a magical realism story in a lot of ways. There are fantastical elements, but they are interspersed really carefully and, and infrequently. And the main part of the story is concerning a girl that is basically neglected by her mother. And her father is like completely not part of her life. He comes in and out and it's just he, every time he shows up, he makes it worse. Um, Fire and Hemlock has a lot in common with a book that I just finished, Son of a Trickster. Son of a Trickster is also sort of a magical realism thing, and he is also neglected. But that takes place on a Native American reservation in Canada, in British Columbia. Um it's not on the reservation. He's like outside of it, but there's a heavy native influence there. And it is so similar in a lot of ways to fire and hemlock. I like, it's so much more modern fire and hemlock is written by somebody who is British and it has that flavor to it very strongly. But the themes of feeling alone of having to look out for yourself, of not being able to relate to friends who have family that they can depend on, or just generally being friends with somebody who's like way older. And you really shouldn't be friends the way that you are. And it is sort of weird, but there's not a good way to explain it to people. It's so crazy to me how similar they are. So I'm going to say... If you're interested in a story that's like kind of sad in some ways, but has also its great moments too, both Son of a Trickster and Fire and Hemlock are pretty emotional, but really, really good. And I especially think Son of a Trickster benefits from listening to the podcast along with it, because the person who commissioned those, Robin, she is... um I, I think she said that her mother is from the tribes described in the uh, story. And she gives me a lot of background in an email that I read on like, the air and a couple different comments as well that help with understanding the circumstances in the story, because otherwise I would not have had context for certain things and I wouldn't have understood why they were important or what was even meant by them. Like historically, there are certain things that if you aren't from those areas and if you aren't native, you aren't going to know. And thus the meaning of certain fr of like insults that people make or frustrations that they have, it's going to be really difficult. So um, fire and hemlock, you don't need that sort of context. You're able to pretty much get it. Son of a trickster is a little bit different and there's much more of the um, native mythology uh, woven in there as well. Um, but though I'm, you know, I never like to like go as far as saying that I was neglected as a kid, but I was a really smart, perceptive kid who watched my parents who were too young, like really kind of muddle their way through raising me sometimes. And so I have a lot of sympathy for characters who feel like they're like the, the adults in their lives can't really be depended on. And I just think that these are two writers really seem to like get that vibe and they write it in a way that manages to be very matter of fact without ever being melodramatic about it, which is the thing that can be a turnoff. It's like, yeah, I want to, I want somebody to write about these issues and talk about these issues, but I don't want them to make it into like a pity party. And they don't the, um, so I just wanted to mention those two because they're so similar in some ways and they both really affected me in that vibe. Um, so there are so many books on this list. I'm looking through what I did for book club right now that I really did not like. First of all, Bag of Bones, which I covered with the guys from Overdue. Uh, don't do it. Blindness. Oh my God. You all <sighs> blindness got some kind of like award and I'm still mad about it. It's been like age that book was the worst. Please don't waste your time. It was so exploitative and pointless. And I hated every minute of reading it. 
I stuck with it because it was for the show and because I trusted that there was like going to be some good that came at the end that felt like everything had been worth it. Not so at all. So I just want to spare you guys the the frustration of pushing yourself to finish something that it turns out simply doesn't pay off in the end. Similarly, Snow Crash and Cloud Atlas, two books that I'm not sorry I read them. I feel like it was a it was educational in its way to read the two of them. But I absolutely would never recommend either book. Cloud Atlas I found really frustrating um, and in some ways just flat out manipulative. And Snow Crash felt more like some guy's like weird theory that he decided to try and weave into a story and it didn't work out and completely fell apart at the end. And there is like straight up chapters of exposition that are not done in a subtle or graceful way at all it's very inelegant and tedious to get through so yeah i know that they made them into movies i think they made snow crash into a movie as well did they but i know they did cloud atlas i've never seen either so i have no idea um rachel says i have not heard great things about cloud cloud atlas yeah it's the sort of thing that like they're the way it's structured is the stories are split up it's covers like several different people and naturally, when it's like a few separate people, there are stories that you really want to hear more of. And then they end and they'll move on to another person that you're like, oh, this fuck, I don't care about this guy. So it was just sort of annoying that I kept getting involved in, in pieces of the book that I was very invested in. And then abruptly, the author would switch points of view and I'd be like, but damn it. And it, they would, it would never come back to the person that I had actually started to really be interested in. I did like Snow Crash when I read it, but it was years and years ago when I was perhaps less discerning. I had a hard time getting into it, but I really liked Hero and YT. I liked the characters a lot, and that was sort of what kept me going. And um, But then it felt like the author just didn't know where to go with it. And so it ends with this weird, like, battle on a floating, like, flotsam ship that was just weird and confusing and a mess. Um, huh, we won't talk about Dune. I hated it. I'll leave it at that. Um, the Girl with All the Gifts, another zombie book that I thought was excellently done. Really, really enjoyed that. And if you're looking for spooky books, because I, I um, chose, what did I choose? Oh, I chose It for one year at October, Haunting of Hill House for the other year at October. And then what was the one last year? Um, do, do, do. Oh, right. I chose uh, Dead Until Dark, which it turns out really isn't scary at all because that's one of the Sookie Stackhouse books. Um, Stephen King is pretty hit or miss for me. <laughs> As anybody who has listened to my Dark Tower podcast will know, I enjoyed it. I think it was way too long, but I did find it pretty fascinating. And if you are looking to get your money's worth with an Audible credit, that's a fucking 40 hour long audio book. So you, you'll sure get what you want. Um, but I am not confident that everything in that book needed to be in that book. And also, it, it definitely it falls into the category of male writer decides to write group of boys plus one girl who is the love interest for all of them. And that's really, really tiresome to me now. So I feel like I had more patience with that when I first read it. And as time has gone on, I have less and look back on that book less favorably than I used to. Uh, Yama says, it was fucked up and the rape shit. Fuck that. Yeah, there's a lot of like gross sexual stuff that goes on in that book that I'm just kind of like, what were you thinking, Stephen King? Um, but Rebecca, um, which I put as a September book leading into spooky book season, Rebecca isn't exactly scary, but it's really unnerving. It's a classic for a reason. Same with Haunting of Hill House. I loved Haunting of Hill House. Now, if you listen to that book club episode, you'll see that I covered that book with money, Chris Tex, and he did not like it. He found it really frustrating. 
I could not disagree with him more. And I feel like that book more than any other piece of media that him and I have talked about together really marks the points at which he and I are like our opinions on things diverge. Um, because for me, The Haunting of Hill House being as atmospheric and vague and nonsensical in some ways as it was, that's exactly why it worked for me. For Chris Tex, he wanted things to be a little bit more... I feel like he wanted things to be less superstitious feeling and more concrete in a way. And that's... I'm not looking for that in a in a spooky story. So I loved... Haunting of Hill House. Like that's going to be the kind of book that I think I might read or listen to the audiobook again and again in October around spooky time of year, spooktober as the gentleman from Overdue call it. Um so let's see what else. Oh, I'm not going to try and get into anything that I've done too recently except that I will say Sharp Objects and Gone Girl are both amazing. And Gillian Flynn is an OG in my book. I understand why people did not like Gone Girl. They were frustrated with the like weirdness of the main character being like kind of a sociopath and whatever. That's fine. It was great. And I stand by that. I loved that book. And Sharp Objects was riveting. Like that... I, you know, when if you want combo character stuff plus, let me move this cat, character stuff plus plot stuff, she really knows how to do both extremely well. She creates characters that are absolutely one of a kind. And they are one of a kind because maybe they're a little unbalanced. And that imbalance is what makes the plot so bananas. Um... So I just think that she's great. I'm hoping to read another one of her books for book club in the future soon. Um, And I'm just really into how much her focus is on imperfect women, because I feel like it's really become a lot more like I, I feel like in recent years, reviewers and bloggers and those of us who consume media in general have started to realize how true it is that women characters who are not likable, and I put that in quotes because that can mean so many things, they are looked on as a lot more disposable or dis- like easily dismissed than male characters that aren't likable. It's just really annoying how much Even fictional women have to be likable in order to be successful. And Gillian Flynn's focus on women who flawed is a very like generous kind way of putting it. Her focus on women who are sometimes outright like psychopaths, I think is really compelling um, and it's a it's a fine line to walk having women who are, you know, who are characters who are imperfect, but who aren't embodying all of the terrible stereotypes of like, you know, uh, hysterical women or bitter, jealous women or whatever. And uh, unfortunately, if we're trying to write women who are sort of anti heroes, that trap is an easy one to fall into for male writers, especially. And Gillian Flynn is just sort of, she's just great at being like, oh, no, 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 yeah, she's a bad person, like, for sure. <clears throat> but also, like, don't you, like, kind of want to know what she does next? And you're like, yes, I do, Gillian Flynn. So, big ups to everything that she has written. Um. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, oh, oh. The Atrocity Archives. I don't. That one came right after Dirty Job. Um, I cannot tell you all enough how mad I was about Dirty Job. So if you go to the book club uh, feed on iTunes, you'll see that it's not the title of the episode isn't called 
a dirty job. It's called RIP to a dirty job because me and Krista recorded the whole episode. I thought she was recording her sound on her end, but I never explicitly asked her to. I thought that she knew and she did not. So I just wound up not recording a replacement file for that because that book was absolute trash from basically beginning to end. It was super racist, super transphobic, super misogynistic. Every box you want to tick in terms of being like offensive, <clears throat> offensive in that 90s way of where, oh, it was just funny. I mean, you know, because those people are really weird. That is what that book was. And when I realized that we had lost our file, it wasn't even worth it to me to read, to re uh, record that one. So I just posted an episode explaining that I hated the book, that I was mad at everybody who voted for it, and that we weren't going to be doing an official episode for it. Unfortunately, I read the Atrocity Archives right after A Dirty Job, and I feel like I might have liked that book better if I wasn't still in such a bad place from Dirty Job, but I was. And Atrocity Archives is another it's a book with a really interesting premise because so is a dirty job. He basically becomes an agent of death kind of in dirty job. Like the concept is really interesting, but it's filled with all this other trash. Atrocity archives is another really interesting concept in which he's like, part of a government organization that uses technology to cope with like demons and supernatural creatures. Super cool concept. But the main character, like everybody in the damn book is male, except for the love interest and one really annoying ex-girlfriend who's like kind of psychotic. And that's almost it in terms of women characters. And I was already so bent out of shape from the misogyny, like there's literally describing women as fuck puppets. I'm not kidding. At least two dozen times throughout the book is a thing from Dirty Jobs. And I was still sort of reeling from how disgusting and overt that was. So when I got into Atrocity Archives and this like low key misogyny that is sort of, I think I could have let it roll off me if I wasn't already so irritated, but I couldn't do it. So I didn't enjoy this one either. Um, Yama says, you have a point there. Got to try her books. Didn't like Gone Girl, but I think it's because it's so far from my own mind. Yeah, see, if you listen to the book club, Yama, I'd be interested to hear what you think, because Gone Girl, I related to that psycho woman a little bit too much, to be honest. And I really enjoyed that book a lot. But I feel like I came at it from a very different perspective than a lot of people did. Uh, Rachel says Roxane Gay has an essay in one of her books about unlikable women. And it's really interesting. I think she references Gone Girl too. Yeah, that is like, you don't get much more unlikable than Amy. And yet, oh, I love Amy so much. <laughs> um, so okay, let me um, because I'm I'm trying to make sure that I stay on track with like uh, some of the books that I have like covered for the book club that maybe I, I have changed my opinions on or that I have a specific reaction to for a specific reason that I want to talk about. Um, and Patricia Bing Grant, she commissioned uh, Fire and Hemlock in part because of how much I loved Howl's Moving Castle, which is also by Diana Wynne Jones. And I covered Howl's Moving Castle for the book club. And that was really fun. I really enjoyed that book a lot. Another uh, female main character who is not perfect, but really interesting and surprisingly complex for what's ostensibly a children's book. Um, you want to get into books that are really emotional and draining but worth it. The book that I recommend with so many asterisks next to it is Kite Runner. And I know that this is a super famous book and that I'm not at all original for recommending this book. Don't care. Kite Runner is the kind of book that will never leave you once you've read it. You will think about it 
practically daily. It is one of the most moving books I've ever read in my life. Like I'm getting choked up just thinking about it. It's horrific in parts. And when I say horrific, I mean triggering in every respect. Sexual violence against men and women and children. Um, Outright violence, beheadings, stonings, all of this. Um, Political violence. Uh, There's so much in that book that if you are feeling at all fragile in that way. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I mean, like, we have, there's a lot happening in the world. And if you don't want to put yourself through this, I really, really get it. At the same time, it is so hopeful and beautiful. And in a strange way, uplifting and respectful of of the light of, like, humanity and the hope for it that it feels worth it in the end because there are some books that they put you through hell and in the end all they seem to have to say is well the world sucks what can you do and it's like thank you for that what i'm i I, i'm I'm an adult now i know this already i i don't need a book to tell me the world sucks and what are you gonna do kite runner doesn't do that kite runner's like The world sucks. And here are some small things you can do to change everything for one person. And if that isn't enough, I don't know what to tell you. Because one person is everything. And it's so good, you guys. It's so good. So super choked up, but like seriously. If you are ever in a place where you feel like you're ready to do this, the writing is stunning. The, the, the man who wrote it um, is from that area in Afghanistan where most of it takes place. So it's all written from like memories that he has. And it paints such a distinct picture of an area that I feel like Americans were not, at least in my generation, but I would argue earlier generations as well did not become familiar with until it had become like a bombed out wasteland. And it was a thriving, rich, like lustrous area of the world before everything started to really go sideways. And I don't think I knew that it was so alive in this way so recently it's not it has not been very long um so i i found it to be simultaneously really educational but also just so emotionally moving and so honest and and just it's it's tough it really is but i really would say it's worth it if you have the spoons for it as they say um, so yeah, and in second place on that front on emotional books that are a lot, The Book Thief, I really feel like if I hadn't read The Kite Runner first, The Book Thief would have affected me more than it did. The thing is, for me, I think sometimes unfamiliarity of a situation can lend its own sort of like excitement to a story. And Where and when the kite runner takes place is very unfamiliar territory for me. So I was wrapped, you know, just wanting to know everything I could absorb everything I could learn about different like traditions and and celebrations and the way things were handled. Whereas Book Thief takes place in Germany, I believe it's in Germany during World War Two. It's a lot more familiar and the stakes are a lot more familiar and to a degree because they're so familiar it feels almost a little cliche and that's not fair but you know what i mean when i say that like it's not fair that 
Nazis are real, a real thing. Hitler was a real person. But when you say somebody's basically like Hitler, it's practically like you're calling them Dracula. It feels so outside of like real reality because it was the the scope of the evil was so huge that it almost feels like a fantasy story in a way like this this unspeakable evil that is the the man who was in charge of its name is synonymous with evil that that backdrop it didn't have the same effect on me because I was like ready for it in a way that I wasn't for Kite Runner. However, it was still beautifully written. It's just very over the top with its language. I think that was really what did it for me with it not being as effective as Kite Runner in the end. Book Thief has a purple prose sort of thing going on. And if you have the patience for that, you'll like it a lot more probably, and it will affect you more. But I had a lot of problems with the way that certain things were written um, and how distracting it was to, for the prose to be so over the top. Um, there's a moment where like her face was a slander. Her eyes were slashes in a, in a, uh, you know, brick of, it's just a bunch of words that like, if you did this once in a while, using words in a really unusual way, applying them to contexts that they've never been applied to by other writers, I feel like it would really grab your attention and make you go, oh, wow, that was a nice little turn of phrase. But the author does that constantly throughout over and over again. So it starts to wear down on me as a reader versus getting my attention. Um Let's see. I love the book Thief's uh, first read it when I was 14, just about to start Bridge of Clay, which is also by Marcus Zuzak. Oh, I never heard of that one. Um, but yeah, I'll be interested to hear what you think of it, Jackie. Um, all right. So in, I'm going to go back to spoil me real quick and, and what I have been covering for that, um, because there have been so many things. So the first book, you want to hear me cry again? Go and listen to... Um, so you want to be a wizard, the first episodes of uh, Spoil Me, because I'll tell you what, guys, I pretty much cried my eyes out at the end of that book. Whew. There goes a book that feels like really familiar. It's, you know, a couple of kids who find out that they're wizards. It's a very standard thing, right? Wrong. <laughs> um, very, very, very wrong. This is so different. And the way that the first book ends, this author fucking ripped my guts out. She was so like, it's super hopeful. But in this way, that's like, so it makes you rethink your own stance on giving people second chances and caring about what happens to them in a way that's very like, oh, we can do better. We can we can do so much better. Why don't we do better? And it's gorgeous. And I swear to God, I don't think I've ever cried on camera like that. Uh, like covering anything else. It, I just straight up like sobbed through the last like 10 minutes of that episode um, for the finale of that book. So yeah, highly recommended. Um going back and just double checking some other things that I've covered because sunshine was mixed in there. Um, parable of the sower and I'm covering parable of the talents right now. I really like those books, but I have to say in the climate that we're in right now, in some ways it's just straight up depressing because this writer predicted a lot of what's happening and it doesn't get better in the time that we're reading it. So it sort of makes me feel like we're just at the beginning of like a real downslide in the timeline of humanity. And that can be a little bit bleak, but it's pretty compelling as well. And so I have mixed feelings on that one in terms of recommending it. I feel like it's a valuable read in that this was such an influential writer who got all of this stuff, right? Like, 
early enough that it's a little alarming how dead accurate she was. But at the same time, I'm like, you could just read the news, though, and then, like, extrapolate from there. The one thing I will say about those is that the main character is sort of working on creating a religion. And I say creating with some hesitation because it's almost like she feels that she's uncovering a religion that's already there and she's just figuring out how the pieces fit together. And that winds up the, like the concept behind it is that God is the force of change and that God is something that we can shape and is inevitable and painful, but also we can work with it. And I think that's a pretty compelling concept. Um, So in that respect, I recommend it, but I don't feel like I want to recommend it to people living through this era right now. Maybe like 10 years from now, I'd feel better about it. If things get better, who knows? Um, All right. So let's talk about Iron Druid real quick. Let's talk about what to me feels like the elephant in the room. Because Iron Druid is the only book series that anybody has commissioned that has really fallen off practically completely. Um, I finished the first book and I was like enjoying the first book, but I kind of had my reservations about parts of it. And then we started the second book and I just got really mad because the main character for me does not take responsibility for the shit that he does at all and feels really entitled and really like just there's no sense of deep morality that comes through at times that I feel like it's most important, but then it does come through at other times where I really don't care and it's uneven for me. Um, And I think that the people who had commissioned the chapters of the second book just got really frustrated with how frustrated I was And basically we're like, ah, this is not worth it. I'm not going to like pay to hear her trash this book anymore, which I really understand. I don't think I was trashing the book because honestly, the world that he built in that story is a really interesting world where gods and fairies and monsters and whatnot are all like mixed in together living amongst us um, in an even more explicit way than in say the Dresden files, like Dresden files has some of that, but things like gods and whatnot don't really come around. You might see one here or there, or one of them is hinted to be a God, but you're never like sure. But in, in iron Druid, the gods walk in and out of his house and his business frequently, you know, like they're, they come in looking like people. Um, so in the in that respect, I found it really interesting. I actually really liked that aspect of the world building for Iron Druid. And I even liked the um, fact that his powers are a little bit different than like, yes, he has his own powers, but he also draws power from the earth, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think if you're looking for something Probably I haven't listened to the audiobook for Iron Druid, so I don't know how they are. But they strike me as the kind of books that would be great, because there's a, a bunch of them, to listen to on audiobook and just kind of let wash over you. I don't think that they benefit from the kind of reviewing that I do, because I think that I scrutinize more than this author intended, and I really find a lot of cracks in the story. Um So it's the kind of thing that I I recommend for fun. But if you're looking for something that's going to like really scratch that Dresden Files sort of itch, I see it recommended a lot in that regard. And I don't agree. It's the the closest reason that they would be recommended as sort of analogous to one another is because they're both wizards that are living in cities and, you know, kind of protect that city. But Dresden Files has a much slower, more deliberate character arc that I find way more compelling. And the main character in Iron Druid is like 
over a thousand years old, but has this the attitude of like a 17 year old boy most of the time. And I don't have a lot of patience for it. So take that as you will. Um, and I'm planning just for the reference of everybody um, to inst inst institute. Is that the right word I want? Well, I'm going to start a policy that if a story, if somebody starts commissioning a book or a TV show and they take more than like five months to commission the next one, I'm going to co cross it off the list and make it off limits because it's too much for me to pick up after that amount of time. It means that I will have to go back and reread a bunch before I can even get into the chapters that have just been commissioned in order to like remember what was going on. And it winds up not being worth it. So I have a suspicion Iron Druid is just done. I don't think I don't I have not heard anybody else talk about how they were going to continue it. Um, it has been quite a while since the last episode. So I'm going to probably look into getting the audiobooks for it and just like tear through them myself and see how I feel about them when I'm not covering them in this way. Um, but I just there, you know, and that's the thing. There are some books that are just not meant to be covered the way that I cover them. And that is totally fine. They don't have to, you know, not everything has to be like something that will stand up to analysis. It's just some things are just meant to be fun and a good time. And this just didn't really work out for the style that not only I cover things in, but like what I'm looking for when it comes to a male protagonist. I have higher standards now than I used to in that respect. And I feel like I have a lot lower tolerance for male gaziness or flippant attitudes and glibness and whatever. Um, so that's how I feel about that one. And I just uh, want to be upfront about that because it's sort of what lead, what's leading me to instituting, I can't tell if I'm using that word right, this new policy. Um, all right. Magician's Guild. Okay. This, here goes a trio of books. So Magician's Guild, uh, second book is The Novice. Last one is The High Lord. Um, this book series was super fun. I feel like it's similar to Iron Druid in that it would be better to go through them a little bit more quickly. Um, I think it's, it stood up a lot better than Iron Druid did to going chapter by chapter. And they're pretty fast moving. But I think that this was a series where the concept was better than the execution, at least at the end. I really liked the first two books and... and found them pretty compelling and like um I thought that the main character who is female and who is very imperfect I liked her and thought that she had a lot of common sense and logic characters like communicate with each other it in a lot of ways it, it sidestepped some of like the worst problems that I have with uh with fiction and so I respect that a lot the final book though has a weird ending and the person who commissioned those agreed with me when I was kind of like, I don't really like how they handled this. And they were like, yeah, OK, me neither. And that made me feel a little bit better that they agreed with me on that, because um, that was Ashley who commissioned those. And I really, really enjoyed the first two. I could honestly say that you could go so far as to read the first two and not even read the third one, but I won't. Also, there's a weird um, romance that you guys know how I feel about romances most of the time. And this was one that I found a, like a little bit inappropriate. And so I had my hangups on that. And a lot of the last book kind of revolves around that romance. So that's a big part of why that book didn't work for me. But I think they're pretty fun. So again, that goes in the fun read pile. Um, let's see what else. Oh, Six of Crows, guys. So this is one of the books. This is um by Leanne Bardugo, and it's part of a whole series. The Grisha trilogy is the one that comes before Six of Crows, I think. I haven't read any of the Grisha trilogy. Um, Six of Crows I completed and then went on to I can't remember the next one. I think it's called Crooked Kingdom. I did two episodes on Crooked Kingdom and have not had anybody commission anything further on that. 
another one that I'm thinking I may have to shelve. We'll see. A couple of the people who were the most invested in that particular series and who were commissioning it steadily after everything happened with Maggie and her being removed from the unspoiled group, uh, those people left like in solidarity with her. So that's part of the reason why not only did the Lee Bardugo books, but also Veronica Mars has a lot less like participation and sponsorship than it did because so many people bailed at that point, which is unfortunate, but I feel like I did the right thing and I'm really not sorry. So if people are going to do that, then that's what they're going to do. Um, so that's like, I really, really liked six of crows a lot. And Talk about character development. This bitch does not play. She gets hard into people's pasts. And I think it's super interesting. The world she's built is also really compelling. And the way that each of these characters copes with the world around them is totally different. And I think it's really, really well done. So I'm interested in continuing with those. If We'll see how long it takes if, that's, uh, if they're able to get in under the wire. And if not... I'm not going to be sad to just tear through them on my own. I'll be fine with that. Um, and the audiobooks for those, I've done both uh, reading from my Kindle and also listening to the audiobook. The audiobooks, I wouldn't say they're full cast, but each chapter is told from the perspective of a different character. And so there's a different narrator for each perspective. Um, and in the, in that way, I think that they're done really well. But I do feel like I like it was a rare case where it was no fault of the narrators at all. I just liked reading it physically better because there's a lot of like little language moments or like descriptions of things that I feel like it really helps to see them in front of you to absorb it because it's a very intricate sort of world. Um, and let's see, do, do, do going up through all of these, um, Dark Lord of Dirkholm. There goes a weird book. I liked that book, but the ending was uh, a little bit abrupt. But it's a really cool concept. So I do recommend that one if you're looking for something that's fantastical and also like weirdly funny. It's got a lot of humor to it. It's just really strange. Um, basically, it's supposed to be that there's like a, a separate world that's kind of you can reach it via a certain portal from ours and some guy has decided to take over this other world and use it as like an amusement park and exploit it in order to get tourists in and out and it's a really like clever idea and i thought that it was really well done and that's another diana Wynne jones book i i liked that one a lot um oh fifth season you guys <sighs> all right so we'll, let's talk about books with uh Really heavy racial implications, um, usually written by black authors. Fifth Season and Children of Blood and Bone fall under this category. Children of Blood and Bone, despite how tragic and brutal it is, is downright lighthearted compared to Fifth Season. But Fifth Season has some of the most brilliant writing I have ever read in my life. There goes a fucking author, and she deserves every award that she has ever gotten, because goddamn, this bitch knows what she's doing. And I, you know, if I'm going to think of other books that I, like, cried while I was recording them for Spoil Me, I definitely cried during fifth season a couple times. Um, If you are... If... This, If you are somebody who is a, either a person of color yourself or really aware of race issues, and, and I mean really aware, I think this book is going to resonate with you so deeply that you're going to occasionally have to put it down. That said, it's excellent. It's so good. It's so, so good. Ugh. Nobody's commissioned the second one yet that I see or else they've done it for like way in the future. But um, I am here for it when they do. The first book 
I wouldn't even say it ends abruptly. It's simply that there is so much left to be resolved once it ends that I was just like, no. But the characters, the way that it's written, it plays with time a little bit. It's just... And and it's done in like a first person or a second person like present perspective sometimes where it's like you walk through the hall and it's like the kind of thing that should not work. And yet it totally works. And I don't really understand why some authors can pull this shit off and others don't like I this. So um, fifth season, I liked Children of Blood and Bone, but I definitely had some like problems with with parts of it. Um, that I didn't think worked super well and it felt much more what's the word I want formulaic um it it was a, a little bit more predictable it was a little bit more uh I, I it just dealt in tropes a lot more and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but it just gives the whole book a certain tone that I think is a little bit easier to digest fifth season is some is is so different in the in the way that it is written in the way that it is structured and in the story that it is telling everything about it is so different that I think it's a kind of book if you read it you're going to need to like give it your full attention this isn't something that you can listen to in an audiobook and tune in and out at all i would not do that it's worth it it's worth your attention um trying to make sure that i'm not skipping anything that i like particularly loved oh saga i don't know that this counts because it's a comic book and i haven't finished it yet but i've been really enjoying it for what it's worth um and trying to see what else we've got in here. Uh, da, da, da. So much Deadwood, guys. Thank you to Patrick for commissioning that. Um, I feel like I've got basically everything covered. I'm currently um, in the middle of reading a Witcher book, and I covered one for the book club, and now I'm doing one for Spoil Me. And um, I think if you're looking for something that's a lot of like, it's it's one overarching story, but it's interspersed with lots of smaller stories. I think the Witcher series is great for that. It's nice, like kind of bite sized, and especially in the one that we covered for um, the book club, which I'm not. I'm trying to find exactly what it was called, um, but that was the prequel, and it was a little tough to follow because of me not having the some of the context because the prequel was written obviously after the first book or second book even maybe um and so the author seems to assume that you know what certain words are or represent and i didn't um the last wish that's the one i did for the book club um oh melanie's here hi melanie um i went over to the other page i didn't even see that you wrote it right there for me um but I feel like if you are okay with with sort of rolling with it when you don't totally know what they're talking about and eventually it'll sort of make sense, um, I think that they're pretty fun for like – there's a lot of uh, – oh, this is sort of like Snow White but a weird version of it or this is like Beauty and the Beast and I like that aspect of it a lot. Um, oh, start answering. Um, something I want to understand better are the other shows affiliated to unspoiled, but that you're not a part of says Yama. Um, okay. So in terms of like, what do you want to understand about them? Um, none of those are covering books. First of all, I'm pretty sure, right? Everybody's covering TV shows for those. Um, but what those are is basically people who really wanted to people who I had gotten to know and trusted um, who really wanted to do coverage of something that it seemed there was a demand for other listeners, like were eager to listen to this particular topic being covered, but that I myself was not interested in covering. So Buffy being the, the first one that kind of got the ball rolling, 
I did not want to do a Buffy podcast because I did not think Buffy was going to stand up to scrutiny. And I love Buffy enough that it not standing up to scrutiny would break my heart. So I just didn't want to put myself through that and be in the position of having to defend what I know is like a silly show from somebody who is looking at it seriously. Um, Essentially, I did not want to be doing what I find Jamie having to do with me with Doctor Who, you know, because a lot of you love Doctor Who so much. And it's sort of like and even Jamie is saying that there are episodes that she liked that once we're done covering them, she's realizing like, oh, actually, that's not super good. And maybe that's like valid that I maybe the fact that I wouldn't like Buffy after recovering it is just sort of like growth as a person, but I don't want to grow. I just want to like Buffy. That's all I want. So that's part of why I didn't do that. Um, Lost is one that I would have liked to like cover in theory because it's such a weird show with so many twists and turns. I would have been very like interested in watching somebody go through that, but I hated how it ended. I hated the last two seasons of it. And I knew That there was no way I could cover that show and not infect whoever was co-hosting with me with this dread or just basically my my prejudice against the ending. Um, So that's that's basically it, is that people who do the uh, affiliated shows are covering things that I think are totally worthy of coverage and that I know people want to listen to, but I just personally don't want to be involved with doing it. Band of Brothers is like just too emotionally draining. Um, and what is the other? Oh, The Punisher. Oh, yeah. Talk about draining on that one. Um, I, I'm not like against covering The Punisher, but covering Netflix shows in general, I'm just realizing is pretty tough. Uh, having to cut cut it down to like, Last year for uh, Stranger Things, Maggie and I did like multiple episodes of the show per podcast episode, and it wound up working out, but I don't love doing it that way. So I think if there are other like Netflix shows that wind up coming up, I may turn those over to somebody else if they're interested. Um, So yeah, that's about it. And, you know, I always I'm, I'm pretty careful about what I trust any of my like affiliate shows to cover because there was a point where a lot of people were wanting to listen to unspoiled Handmaid's Tale for example and I personally have no interest in watching that show it sounds way too brutal I it just is too close to home I don't feel like it's it's just too real, you know? And at the same time, it is about such a fraught issue. Um, a series of fraught issues, because we're talking about, like, women's bodily autonomy and misogyny, but also there's racism and classism and whatnot. Um these are topics that I feel incredibly passionate about, but also I feel very specific about. So we had a little bit of a meeting in the, um, the group for all of the co-hosts and a bunch of people volunteered to cover it. And I put the kibosh on it. And I was like, listen, I appreciate that you want to cover it, cover it. I'm not saying it's not worthy of coverage, but I don't want to cover it myself. And I am not willing to trust anybody as much as I love all you guys. And I really don't think I need to worry. I'm not willing to trust anybody talking about this sort of issue with unspoiled's name on it, because if they, you know, take a step in a wrong direction, I feel like that's going to fall to me to deal with. And I just didn't want to take that risk. So there are some things that I absolutely just want to stay away from And even my co-hosts, I'm not going to let them cover it either, if that makes sense. Um, So, yeah, that's what's going on with that. Um, Because it is, you know, there's a lot out there that I feel like you 
could make a an argument for why it's valid, but there's such fraught issues that it's just a like landmine, you know. Um, so I'm trying to think what else I want to mention because there are things that I've listened to on my own um, that I have not done for the show. So after I covered Dead uh, Dead Until Dark, which is the first book in the Sookie Stackhouse series. I enjoyed the hell out of that. And I blew through every audiobook for that in probably like three weeks. I maybe a month. I just, there's like 16 books or 14 books in that series. And I read slash listened to them all. Um, if you are looking for something with a compelling lead female character, it is so much better than true blood i cannot even begin to tell you guys after i finished the series i was still kind of jonesing for it you know how that goes so i started to rewatch true blood because i never finished it owen had never seen it before at all so we started it and off like at the start he was like i love this show this is so weird and then you get into the last couple seasons and you're just like what are you doing and the books are not like that the books just develop more and more complex plot lines as time goes on because the politics of everything is super important in true blood everything is very physical like the domination of one vampire over another is all about like who's going to be able to kill the other first in the books there's a lot of political machinations and the implications or consequences of doing something rashly are a lot higher and really taken seriously and the characters are all a thousand percent smarter than they are on the show. So if you're looking for something that's like kind of fluffy, but still really gives you something to chew on, I really recommend the Sookie Stackhouse books. I thought they were really fun. I have had a lot of people say that they thought the writing was so bad in the first couple that they couldn't get past it. I maintain that I'm a bad judge of writing unless it's so terrible that you can't possibly miss it because I didn't think the writing was that bad at all. Like, it's not amazing, but I had no problem with it. It wasn't like I kept stopping and being like, oh, Jesus, this chick, you know, that did not happen for me. So, you know, take that for what you will. Um, and like I already said, the Kinsey Milhone mysteries, these are a really nice, like, background audiobook series that I love having on when I'm just cleaning the house or doing things that I just need to have like I, I want something on to sort of keep me company but they're like the writing is sort of weirdly perfunctory like she'll be like um I stepped out of the car onto the street slammed my door and pocketed my keys then made my way to the front porch it's very every single step of everything is specifically like outlined and mentioned in this way that i think a lot of people feel is unnecessary i've seen complaints about it but which for me for some reason is like sort of endearing in a way and gives me a, a sense of comfort now that i'm on like book 20 or something i'm like close to the end of the series now um so that's a really good just straight up background one that they're easy to get you know those are all over audible you can also get abridged versions but i don't really know why you do that i just listen to the whole thing um and i'm trying to think what else i've i've listened to on my own oh my god you guys so a discovery of witches some of you probably saw got made into a tv show i'm not really like even remembering who it is is it cbs or um and it's the first book in a series. Now, I can be hard on things, but this is one where I don't feel like I can be hard enough on it. A Discovery of Witches, I thought was one of the worst books I've ever read. It is absolutely infuriating. It's two thirds too long nothing happens most of the time and the main character is a woman who has powers but doesn't want to use them for reasons that feel completely irrational and contrived to draw the story out and i just because of the popularity of the show getting the book itself more attention i feel a kind of like i feel duty bound 
to let all of you know not to fall for it. And please don't waste your time because that audiobook was like 25 hours long and it could have been five hours long. There was so little substance. It was tedious. It was stupid. And the main character and her love interest are the most boring people in the world. They're, they like have hard to, hardly any fucking personality at all. And I just can't, y'all. I When I saw that, that book got made into a TV show, I was just like, I don't get it. I really don't. Like the TV show, they're going to have to add so much to make it interesting that it will have to be a totally different story, I would imagine. There's just, there's no way they can use what is in that book to make a TV show is what I'm saying. Like, there's just not enough. Um, so either it's the most boring TV show ever, or it has very little to do with the first book. Um, so yeah, just warning you guys on that one. I've had pretty good luck with things um, that I've read on my own because a lot of the time I'll go down that path based on a recommendation from a book that I've read for the show or a book that I've heard covered in like overdue. And uh, that is one that I picked up on my own and I kind of feel like it's led to me never trusting my own judgment again. I'm only going to listen to people's recommendations and I'm not going to go off of like what it sounds like to me when I read the back cover. Um, and I listened to Sphere, the audiobook for Sphere, um, because I loved Jurassic Park, which I covered for the book club. Super great. Love logistics. All about it. Sphere hated it. Hated it so, so much. So Michael Crichton is a pretty hit or miss for me, as it turns out. Um, he gets into logistics a lot, which I oftentimes really enjoy. But occasionally he gets into logistics about like certain fields that I have not only no background in, but no interest in. And so it's just womp, 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 womp after a little while. Um, I'm trying to look down and see what else I've got here that I... Did you, oh, Fever Dream. I forgot I read that. That was a good one. That's another George R. R. Martin book for those of you who are interested in reading something else of his that is not Game of Thrones related. And uh, Fever Dream is about vampires on the Mississippi River, which is pretty much all I need to say about that. And it's kind of sad, but it's also really good. Um, it's weird, but it's weird in that George R. R. Martin way. You know what I mean? So that's one that I think... I, I didn't listen to the audiobook. I read that one. But um, I would really love to listen to the audiobook and just get a sense of what it's like, because I feel like it would lend itself pretty well. So I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I'm meaning, like, you know, that I'm leaving out that I should add. Um, oh, Jennifer Faust sent me um, for one year for the unspoiled Yuletide book exchange. Uh, she sent me a book called, and I have it right over here and I can't see the spine of it. Oh no, I moved it to my, my bedroom. Um, oh, this is going to drive me nuts. The language of thorns, I think is how, what it's called. Yes. The language of thorns Midnight Tales and Dangerous Magic. This is a book that I recommend you read in print because the book itself, the cover is beautiful. It's designed just, it's stunning. And then there are these weirdo illustrations inside that are really, really well done and just add a whole lot of atmosphere. This book is essentially a retelling of a series of like classic folklore or fairy tale stories. And they're done from a slightly more feminist perspective. They're pretty violent sometimes um, and a little bleak sometimes, but they are so good and so interesting, a little freaky. Um, I just, I loved this. So many thanks to Jennifer for sending me that book because it was one of like a pile of books and the others I've been slowly making my way through because she was a real thinker when she sent this to me. And all of the books she sent were a series of like short stories because she knows that I have very little time. And 
that works really well for me. So I'm currently reading through a series of like true stories about criminals and uh, robberies and all that kind of stuff. But um, Language of Thorns just caught my attention out of the gate because of how beautiful and intricate the cover was. And I got sucked in completely. It was just so much fun to read. So if you're looking for something that's like, you can leave it by the toilet or you can leave it by your nightstand and you just have like a, a little, you know, half hour blurbs to read or less. I really recommend the, that book in particular because it lends itself to that kind of reading. And the stories are familiar enough that once you get to the end, you'll be like, oh, that was this story. But while you're reading it, you often don't quite realize what this is an allegory for. So I think that's kind of fun. Like instead of it, you being preoccupied by like, oh, this is clearly seven dwarfs. Like you get to the end and you're like, wait, oh, there's seven of them. Oh, my God, I didn't even realize. And that's a little fun. You know, I like that. Um. Any other questions you guys want me to answer? I'm running out to the end of my uh, hour and a half here, but I don't want to miss if anybody has a particular like, you know, genre that they're wondering about or any book that I haven't talked about and you would like my honest opinion or whatever. Um, obviously, Harry Potter, you can't go wrong. Uh, you can go wrong. Just don't stray out of the original canon, okay? Just everybody be safe. Stay in the lines. Don't wander off. Um, making sure that I'm looking because Song of Ice and Fire is like expanding to all these other books that I intended to cover for the show and I just could not quite get it up for. So I can't even like give you a real recommendation on like a world of ice and fire because I started covering it and then stopped. Um, I'm planning to like remove some of those, I think, from the feed, actually, because it was just such a like completely un we had just lost our our mojo and didn't care, you know, so it's not like that book is not good. It's just something that I don't feel qualified to talk about at this point. Uh, Yama says, I think this was very good. Oh, good. Thank you, Yama, for commissioning this. Um, yeah, I hope that it was helpful. There's just a like I'm finding that. I have a much more open mind in terms of like the style of book I like now than what I used to. And the book club is really helping me open up my, my comfort zone in that respect. Um, and also as I become more aware of like, you know, problems in the world, the way that I view how something is written will change a lot. So there's just been a lot of adjustment happening over the past five years or so for me in terms of the uh, books that I'm reading and enjoying and what I'm drawn to reading and all of that. And I really like I'm making an effort to read more female authors as well. And I'm spe especially seeking out like women of color. Um, and I don't think it's an accident that a lot of those stories or books tend to be more emo like have a lot more depth because they are dealing with issues that are mirroring some of the issues that those groups of people tend to come up against, women and women of color alike. Um, I'm going to take notes and start trying other books. Thank you so much for taking the time for this. Thank you for commissioning it, Yama. I really appreciate it. Um, and I hope that it was helpful to everybody else. And yeah, guys, if you guys have uh, some books, especially, especially if you are okay with me reading it on my own and not covering it and it's part of a big series, let me know because I'm going to be getting to the end of my Kinsey Milhone series soon and I'm going to need a new series to just like put on my uh, audio, my audible list. Um, I don't tend to listen to podcasts. I tend to listen to audiobooks and podcasts I just weirdly like will tune out and completely miss huge chunks of it, but I don't do that with audiobooks. I'm listening the whole time. So Jackie says, have you tried Outlander? Yes, I've read all of them up until Dragonfly and Amber, I think. Was that the last one? I don't want to spoil too much, but uh, there's, oh, that's the second one. Okay, then I went, wait, I went past that because I think I read like five of them. Um, but it gets up to Brianna basically like being more the main character than anybody. And uh, I don't want to spoil too much 
because there's nothing that I can say right now to hint what I'm talking about without it being a spoiler. But I kind of fell off after I think like the fifth one. Um, I don't remember if they, how many are there now, Jackie? Did she keep writing them? I'm going to look up what the series Outlander book series. Here we go. One through eight. God damn. Uh, an echo in the bone. I think that's where I stopped because I definitely read A Breath of Snow and Ashes. Um, but yeah, damn. There are so many. A Plague of Zombies. What? Is that part of the same? An Outlander novella. Oh, these are novellas. So we have The Space Between, A Leaf in the Wind of All Hallows. That sounds awesome. I love that title. Uh, the Custom of the Army. And what's this one? It's not letting me see what the title of the other one is. Um, yeah, I have not read past Breath of Snow and Ashes. I think that I sort of fell off there. Um, but I didn't know about those novellas, so I might, I might check those out because, but I'd probably have to refresh. It looks like there's five novellas, um, based on this picture, I'm trying to see an Outlander novella. There's Virgins, A Plague of Zombies, The Space Between, A Leaf in the Wind of All Hallows. Oh, and The Custom of the Army. Yeah, that's still a novella. It's just, um way that the cover is designed is slightly different than the other four. So I couldn't tell, but yeah, it looks like there's eight main books. Um, so wow, I read six of them. Um, maybe I'll, maybe I'll revisit those. Cause, uh, it's, I really, Outlander was brutal. I mean, they're all brutal in their way, to be honest, but they're really pretty well done and a compelling story, I think. And, that might be a good thing to revisit, um, especially with like the novellas and stuff, adding a little bit of extra spice. Um, there's another coming out apparently also. Good God, this one's a machine. Those are big books, you know, it's not like, you know, another Dresden Files book, which like granted those are intricate books as well, but they're not quite as huge. And her churning these out, it's a lot. Um, but yeah. All right, cool. Well, thank you everybody so much for coming and hanging out with me. Um, if you have any other questions about this, you can just comment in the group and thank you to Yama again for commissioning this. All right, guys, let's see you later. And, uh, don't forget tonight is the cocktail hour. So make sure to come to that if you get a chance and have a drink with me. All right. It's at 8 PM central standard time because I have a Zumba class. So I'm going to be sweaty when I show up, but cut me a break. Toodaloo motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.